I'll turn it over to Jacob. He is sharing his slides. So you can pull that up and take it from here. All right, thank you. Let's see if, uh, have I already started sharing? There we go, let's see. And as we, is that working out? Everybody can see the slides? That looks great, thanks. Perfect, all right. Well, so to talk about the, the topic today, well, I guess before I get started, if, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to interrupt or, or jump in here. Um, you know, the topic today uh, was creative therapy. And so hopefully through this discussion, um, kind of learn what, what creative therapies are, how they can be effective, and, and maybe just different types of creative therapies. So <clears throat> to start off with, uh, this is a, a collage. Uh, this is a way that I, I sometimes will start a group or uh, training in-person trainings and things like that as a, as a way for people to introduce themselves. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of background on me. I have a, a BFA from Utah State. Uh, I have a master's degree in creative art therapies from Nazareth College and then a um, master's, or, uh, and then I got my PsyD from Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. And I currently um, am working in Treasure Valley with uh, Dr. Root. So what are creative therapies? First of all, they're more than, than just arts and crafts. So a little bit more than uh, going and painting ceramics on date night. So more than that. And creative therapies really are, uh, it's just an umbrella term for a lot of different disciplines. <clears throat> so uh, some of those disciplines, uh, art therapy, music therapy, play therapy, drama therapy, they all sort of fall under this umbrella term of, of creative therapies. Um, <clears throat> you know, creative therapists uh, work in, in many different uh, places, uh, psych hospitals, private practice, um, community agencies, really, really in any sort of therapeutic place. Um, and, and really they're, they're appropriate for any population, any, any age um, <clears throat> that, uh, that you can work with. I've, I've had experience with children, uh, adults, senior citizens. Um, you know, I've worked with people with intellectual disabilities, uh, sex offenders, um, people who survive strokes. So kind of all big, large gamut of populations that uh, uh, creative therapies are appropriate for. Um, <clears throat> one kind of fact about creative therapies in Idaho is that there's not really a, a licensing board. There's no sort of regulation. So anybody can, can call themselves one of these things. Um, there are sort of national uh, uh, accreditation uh, places. And so within the art therapy realm, which is where I kind of live most of the time, uh, there's 14 registered art therapies, art therapists in Idaho. Uh, half of those are in Boise. Uh, there are, I know there's a handful of other people in town that do play therapy and music therapy and things like that, but something to kind of think about <clears throat> as you're making referrals or, uh, and things like that going forward is, is what is that education? Is that, uh, what they just like to do art or, or things in their, in their therapeutic process, or, uh, there's some actual kind of training and education behind them. So one of the couple common denominators um, within those creative therapies field really is that it's, it's a, using these creative techniques within a professional relationship and in the therapeutic process. Um, and, and there's purposeful uh, kind of plan ideas for what, for using the, the creative technique um, within the therapy session. Uh, they're based on uh, talk therapy theory. So whether that's psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, humanistic, have a background in, in all these different sorts of approaches to then utilize <clears throat> creative techniques with, with, with clients. Uh, creative therapies are really another vehicle to help with expression, um, disclosure, self-discovery, and, and again, really aiding in that therapeutic process. So <clears throat> why or how do they kind of work? One of the major factors I think is that they really facilitate uh, rapport building uh, with, with the therapist. Um, <clears throat> probably most of you know that uh, most or large portion of uh, therapy that is successful is based on that rapport. 
um, you know, with other factors, um, you know, coming in in second and third place there. So it really helps with that rapport. Uh, they can help, uh, creative therapies are really multicultural <clears throat> in, you know, there, there, there's art and creativity and music in every, um, every culture throughout time. And so it's really naturally, they're multicultural. Uh, so one of the things is really, it, sometimes it's difficult, you know, we've had clients that are it's difficult to express what's going on. And so through the art, um, they can express some of their feelings, their, their concerns um, more readily. And it creates this degree of separation from the problem or, or why they're being seen, makes, making it easier to talk about or, or communicate. You know, my, in my example of this is we've all had that experience or that client that's, oh, I have a friend of a friend who's got this problem, and we all know that they're talking about them. But within the creative therapies, we're now talking about this artwork or this music that they created. Um, and so it makes this, uh, gives that degree of separation to talk about what's really going on. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, an example of that. Um, I had a, a, a client, she was about seven years old. Um, at a clinic in Rochester, New York, um, and there's a pretty large deaf population there. And her her family um, was pretty active in this uh, community. Um, and grandmother, grandfather, parents, uh, younger brother, they were all either deaf or hard of hearing, and, and her hearing was intact. And so as we met, she drew this picture of this dog and and, and these puppies and related that, you know, the dog, that's grandma and the other puppies are, are my family members. And <clears throat> as we were talking about it, she, she added the blue here and, and drew this line that really separates them. And, and so we were able to figure out in that first session that even though parents were bringing us, bringing her to the clinic uh, due to behavioral issues, that those behavioral issues are really about not feeling uh, part of the family, not fitting in. And so um, we were able to direct our, our treatment um, in a more, uh, concise way and really focused not necessarily on just kind of behavioral techniques, but here let's look at family joining and, and making sure you feel part of that family to, to change and improve those, those relationships. So <clears throat> a few other ways that creative therapies are, are helpful um, and they really provide a safe place for symbolic resolution of conflicts, uh, cathartic ways for Ventilating, ventilating or sharing emotions. Uh, we all talk about, uh, you know, we get so angry, we're like a volcano, we're gonna explode. So this is a picture, there's a, a young man, similar, lots of trauma, lots of anger in his life, um, but we were able to, through this process, build a volcano, make it explode, do all the destruction that a volcano needs to do in kind of a safe space versus him, uh, you know, acting out at home or, or in communities and things like that. Um, art therapies are, are pretty multimodal. They help create those new brain pathways. Um, you know, they remind me a little bit of EMDR or the hand movements, you know, approaches um, where we're talking, but we're also having hand movement and things um, to, to help create those new pathways. And I have a couple examples later on that um, I'll talk about with that. Um, and then <clears throat> lastly, it, it really, uh, creates this permanent record of the process um, to reevaluate, let's check on our progress uh, that we've made or you know, that termination session where you talk about that instead of relying on our memory and that progress, we really have this concrete evidence of, oh yeah, I did this and that's where I was at. And you can really see the, the change that people have based on, on their art um, or their, uh, yeah, through their experiences there. Uh, so a couple of different techniques uh, that, uh, that I'd like to use again, um, collage uh, uh, is a good tool. It doesn't rely on really any artistic abilities. You're cutting and gluing, um, so it can remove some of that intimidation that people might feel when you talk about art therapy or creative therapy, you know, especially with adults who haven't had any experience you know, with, with art materials for a while. Photography is a, good, a great way. Uh, now, obviously, everybody can take a fantastic picture and, and manipulate those photos in digital ways. Um, there's a lot of different tools and techniques um, with photography. Uh, Printmaking, um, 
not a lot of people know about printmaking, but if you're familiar with that process, um, the, the act of printmaking can be is really repetitive and kind of can help soothe and get you into this sort of meditative state, um, which can be helpful and relaxing. Uh, it also um, allows for you to sort of make multiple of the same image, uh, which can be a great way to start to kind of explore and express in different avenues with still kind of keeping that original artwork. Sometimes people create things and they're, they're worried about how, you know, ruining it, right? And so, um, or they want to make artwork as gifts so they can make these kind of multiples to, to share with, with others, share their progress with others. Um, <clears throat> so weaving is one tool, you know, there's a, a picture we integrated weaving with, with photography and that phototherapy approach. Um, <clears throat> This is a, a really cool example about those, you know, uh, forming new um, brain paths and things. Um, when I was working in a clinic with survivors of stroke, um, this woman, she was unable to use uh, her, her left hand, her left arm. But when she started engaging in that creative process and, and weaving and, and things like that, and she really liked to sew, uh, she would start to use her, her arm, her, her left hand that, was, um, that she couldn't use before. And so it really helped sort of develop those pathways and she'd be going along and using both hands. And then all of a sudden she'd realize, oh wait, I'm using both hands now. And then, you know, it would kind of stop. But once she would kind of get into that creative process, she was able to, to do that and make, make some progress there. So puppets are, are, are a great way for, for storytelling. Again, this is that kind of removing your yourself by one step uh, to, to tell the story. Um, you can have complicated puppets or you can do popsicle stick puppets and their sock puppets. Um, can be a good uh, tool for starting to be able to share that story, share that expression or that experience um, with, with that degree of separation. So sand play, <clears throat> it's, it's its own, uh, really its own, uh, specialty there, uh, you know, a couple of benefits of, of sand plays is you get to create an environment and you have control over that environment. Uh, um, <clears throat> other, other ways that sand is used is like a, you know, kind of a Zen garden. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes, uh, you know, if, uh, there's other, other things, uh, you know, if people don't like sand because you get, it's dirty or gritty and, um, you know, you can use beans or other different uh, materials within that, but uh, again, sand is a really great way for uh, that self-expression and really being able to control or share an environment. Uh, sculpture, um, <clears throat> whether that's, uh, you know, using like Play-Doh or paper mache uh, or rigid wrap or, or clay, um, this can kind of be one of those those materials that help uh, break down defense mechanisms a little bit. You know, we, we think about, you know, it's kind of a childhood thing playing with, with clay and things like that. And so it can cause uh, some of those defense mechanisms to be uh, reduced um, during, during the therapeutic process. <clears throat> and then another, uh, you know, great thing is just found objects. Um, things off the side of the road, boxes, you know, repurposing chairs. Uh, we have a mannequin here, uh, part of the clinic I worked back with in Rochester, uh, had a handful of uh, adolescents that had some pretty severe burns. And so we you know, were able to um, take this mannequin and, and wrap it in rigid wrap and really kind of recreate <clears throat> some of that process of, of their healing and treatment from those burns. But, now they were in control, right? They got to control that environment and really talk about that experience and, and having a little bit more control over what was going on and was really um, helpful in, in their kind of process of uh, going through their healing um, physically and psychologically. So <clears throat> other techniques really creating Together, um, I think, uh, you know, here's a, a great way for music. When I worked in Alaska, I worked with a lot of Native Alaskans. And so, you know, music and drumming and <clears throat> were a big part. So we, we actually create, built drums out of uh, old tin cans. Uh, we would have drumming circles and just 
communicate our feelings and our emotions without having to talk about them. You know, a lot of them wouldn't want to share or talk about how they're feeling or, you know, kind of on a daily check-in, but uh, they would drum and let you know what was going on through that way. Um, it really also helped in that kind of joining the group process, you know, songwriting through music, um, harmonica breathing really helps, you know, kind of help you set a pace for your breathing. Um, and then painting by music is another uh, great technique, um, you know, with, within groups, uh, group murals, any kind of group project that you're working on together helps to build that group cohesiveness uh, and then can really aid in the conversation about what's going on. Again, all the techniques are really, you know, uh, identified to, in hopes for certain responses or, or, or to facilitate uh, the objectives of those groups. Um, one of the things I, I like to do with uh, couples is having them draw their goals. You know, why are they coming to therapy? What are they doing? And it's really insightful uh, to see where those couples are at individually and in the commitment to, to the relationship and the therapeutic process. Um, just really right within, again, that first sort of kind of session and, and drawing. So <clears throat> kind of techniques that can be pretty simple, uh, good for joining or kickstarting creative process uh, are, are scribble drawings. Uh, and there are what they sound like. Uh, you take a moment, you create a scribble, and then you see what you can create from them. Uh, you know, <clears throat> some of these here we used in like a group process where you scribble and, and draw for a moment, and then you kind of pass it on to the next person in the group. And, and you know, through that process, there's, you know, we worked on group cohesion and then it ended up telling a story about the drawings and how that was relating to the group. Again, really facilitating that project or the, the therapeutic process and getting engagement from all the group members. Um, sometimes you get really nice things. Sometimes you get some colors and scribbles and, and either way, it's okay. Um, Cause it really is more about the, the process than, than the product. And another <clears throat> fairly simple technique that um, I really like are mandalas. Um, and, and the mandala really is just an image drawn within a circle. Um, in Sanskrit, mandala can mean a sacred circle and uh, can kind of be this safe container or holding place for images. Um, I think most of us probably seen like the mandala coloring books and things like that. And it can be very formal and sort of soothing process in that, in that way. Um, <clears throat> I really like to use them sort of in a free form, um, maybe giving, giving a topic like, hey, express how you're feeling today or, or a safe place uh, that we can then talk about. Um, so again, lots of different ways to go through the process or to initiate the process using these techniques. And again, really depending on what the goal is for, for that client. Uh, there are a handful of art therapy assessments, um, you know, some of them, I think the silver drying tests have some normative data on them. Um, I think probably people are more familiar with projective drying assessments, like the house street person, uh, draw person in the rain. Um, uh, the kinetic family drying is, is a great tool um, that helps kind of pick the relationship within a family, family dynamics. Uh, one that I use pretty regularly in my assessments is the, the pee pad or person picking, person picking an apple from a tree. It helps show like a person's ability to problem solve. Uh, there's a little bit of data about uh, kind of helping to diagnose things such as mania and depression um, sort of based on what is present and what is absent from, from the drawings. Um, in, in the road drawing, it's not a, a formal assessment, but it's a good um, tool to gather information um, about a client, kind of where they're at, their history, kind of intents for the future. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of these uh, sort of formal assessments have some pretty thorough, um, you know, uh, handbooks and, and, and guides and trainings on how to, how to use them. Um, so this is like a, an example of a person picking an apple from a tree here in this drawing. Um, you know, I, I was asked kind of how, how can primary care providers use, use these techniques and ideas in their practice and, you know, a couple of limitations popped up for me, you know, 
Uh, part of that is time, you know, it may take somebody two minutes to, to do a drying or it may take them 15 minutes or an hour. And so, you know, you kind of never know what you're going to get. And you might have some ideas based on the person, but um, I, I can see that sort of being a limiting factor. And then, you know, how much training does somebody want to do so they know what they're getting from these techniques? Um, you know, but, but a couple that I think most people can can kind of use or, or recommend would be like those mandala drawings or or a mandala journal where you have them draw a mandala, you know, on a regular basis. Um, and then um, again, the pee pad or the road drawing are really good uh, tools and typically fairly brief, um, you know, um, things like uh, creating like a mixtape or anybody that's under 40 creating a pay playlist uh, to, to listen to or express themselves through, uh, you know, photo journals, I think, again, kind of journaling, but a different approach than just sort of writing it, uh, writing it out. So um, express yourself through a different manner there. Kind of, kind of key points and, and takeaways are, again, just that the creative process, we're using that to, to facilitate the therapeutic process. Um, lots of different approaches, um, mean different benefits, helpful for all ages, populations. Um, and I think ultimately too, it's really that process, process of creating and expression that's most important and not necessarily the, the final product. Sometimes people get stuck on, on that. I, I can't create good art, you know, and you know, it's really that process in, in aiding, uh, aiding what the therapeutic goals are going forward. So that is uh, the nutshell of creative therapies. Uh, yeah, any uh, questions or, or yeah, comments or anything? Jacob, thank you so much. That was such a joy to just absorb the art as well. It's beautiful. Uh, so yeah, let's open it up to some questions for Jacob. Or if you've had experience with art therapy, we'd love to hear it. I do have a question, actually. Um, I'm a psychiatric PA, just so you know, so I'm mostly doing med management, as a lot of you guys would know. Um, but the, uh, my question is, I have a lot of adults with autism in, in my patient list. Um, and as I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar, um, their family members or staff um, come to me saying they're having behaviors, they're doing X, Y, and Z. Can you give them some lorazepam? <laughs> or an antipsychotic or something like that. Um, and I, you know, I'm not saying that those don't have their place, but I hate to just medicate for um, a behavior, especially if you know they don't actually have underlying mental health issues necessarily, but it's just a behavioral thing. Um, so my question is, have you worked with people with autism with these? Um, how have you used it with them? Why have you used it with them? And how might someone like me, who's not trained as far as therapies and counseling goes, um, maybe recommend that those get implemented in, in somebody's care to maybe help reduce behaviors without medications? Yeah, um, so I have worked with a handful of folks with autism um, in, in more you know, I have more experience with folks with intellectual disabilities, and, and I know there's definitely some differences there. Um, but I do think a lot of that is like that that ex expression and like being able to, you know, right, they're having a behavior for a reason. And so what is the reason for that behavior? And if they're unable to sort of really verbalize what that is, whether it's lack of communication skills or, or just not having the words to define that, um, I think that would be sort of where to start with as far as um, using that art therapy or creative therapies to sort of help identify what, why they're having those behaviors, what, what's their need that's not being met or that they're trying to achieve um, through that. Um, so that, that, that would be kind of a starting point, I guess, um, for me. And yeah, I do think it is successful in, in, in being able to then we can figure out what that is, sharing that with staff or family members or um, <clears throat> who, who we need to, to do that. Um, 
And then can you, what's the, what was the second part of your question again? I'm sorry. Um, second part of my question is um, how might I say, you know, often adults with autism, they're in, you know, res hab facilities or something. And, um, you know, and they're working with staff members who aren't really trained in mental health or behavioral health ways. They're just, you know, some people who hang out with them for the day. Um, uh, or, or that's sometimes what it is, I should say. So my question is, how could I help recommend that we implement things like this to help facilitate communication um, in a way that any Joe off of the street could understand and help somebody with um, an intellectual disability or autism do? Yeah, uh, I guess a couple thoughts come into my mind and, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, one would be, you know, kind of top down is getting them with with a creative therapist and then, you know, through that one on one really devising what they're sharing and, and passing that down and maybe coming up with one or two kind of techniques that they utilize uh, to, to share and express themselves and then that can kind of be put in their their daily plan of tools that we use. Um, when I was working with folks with individual uh, with intellectual disabilities and um, <clears throat> definitely there are folks on the autism scale there, um, you know, we'd have regular staff meetings and, and so we could kind of direct some of that, um, you know, those tools that the staff are using through either staff trainings or through the case manager, you know, and then they could communicate it to the daily staff. Um, okay, like these are the couple of things. I think there, do, there does have to be a, a little bit of training just saying this is what we're doing and why. Um, and there's already, you know, in those res tab homes, probably procedures that are set up in place and different things for different clients on an individual plan. So incorporating it within that uh, is, is probably where, where it goes. You know, other ways for communication too, I, I think takes some time to develop, but can you develop you know, picture books, pictures of things that they're feeling, um, you know, um, kind of giving them ways to express themselves non verbally. Is there something for them that symbolizes mad? And, and then they can point to that, right? If, if they're nonverbal. Um, you spend a lot of time talking about feelings and emotions with, with folks. And I don't remember what they're called now, they're, but there's a, you know, the little icons of faces. And sometimes they're helpful and sometimes the, those aren't, but having the individual figure out what what image it is that represents what they're trying to share, um, and then can you create a book that has those in that, or, or or an iPad or whatever that has a whole bunch of pictures that they can say this is this is the one, um, you know, how I am right now. Thank you very much. That was very yeah. helpful. Any other questions for Jacob? Yeah, this is really timely for me. So thank you. I'm, I'm Sheila Weaver. I'm a clinical social worker. And I just kind of shifted my practice fairly recently to working um, really part time in a clinic with youth that definitely has a lot, use a lot of like, utilize like a lot of like um, expressive art type and type interventions, um, things like that. And so I'm just kind of in this real learning phase around this whole modality right now. Are there any like really good resources, books, starting point that you'd recommend to people that are just kind of coming in the right side, coming in on the new side of this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, there's like a, the American Art Therapy Association, like, I mean, there's kind of formal one and they have uh, a conference every, every year and you get some CUs and learn some techniques there. Um, and th there are a ton of, of, of books out there. Um, you know, there's um, some really kind of basic and, and um, like kind of just getting your feet wet uh, books uh, by her name's Kathy Malcody. She has a whole bunch of, of books, starting with like intro to art therapy and, and then going through more um, in-depth things. Um, okay. So that's a good introduction place. Uh, and then kind of like I was saying with like the assessments and stuff, most of those have a formalized kind of manual. Um, a lot of them are, are, are pretty old, like 70s. Uh, so they've been around for a little bit. I saw that. I, I Googled the, the, the Apple one, the picking the Apple one, and it was like 1972. I was like, perfect. <laughs> so it's been around. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So they've so. been around for a little bit. And there's always a grad student that picks them up and, and tries to do a little bit more research on them and things like that. I just don't think they ever get formally published. Um, but 
yeah, so some of those, if you're looking for a kind of assessment tools and things like that are, are good places to start. That's awesome. Thank you so much. This is a great presentation. Thank you. Great questions. Any other questions while we've got Jacob here? Um, Cindy is asking if you could put her name in the chat for the purpose of spelling to find the books. Sorry, Cindy, I'm not following the question. I both. think they're appearing. Oh, I, yeah, I, they're showing up. up there, yeah. I do have right. a resources in that. Uh, oh, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, because I, I would have uh, found a whole different way for Kathy Mellett that spell that name. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch on the resources too. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Well, wonderful. If you do have additional questions, you can put that in the chat. Jacob is here. He can answer questions as well. Oh, uh, oh let's we've got one more question here. Is there a hack for disinfecting the stand? <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> not uh no not that i'm aware of but that's uh yeah yeah no that's a, a tough one it might start with uh the sanitizing ahead of time you know the hand sanitizer before and yeah wiping down all the the, the pieces that you use within the sand play afterwards but the sand itself i don't uh i don't use it uh very often i don't use it anymore and so um, i don't have a good answer for that but i'm sure there's some uv light or something out there that you could use you know, we've had to do that in our agency. We we kids get the opportunity. Do you want to wash your hands or do you want to use the hand sanitizer? So at least going without them, we wipe down all of our little sand tray pieces because that's the that's the, yeah, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, so, Jacob, it's Andrew Barron. Um, I joined late. I apologize for that. I had a last minute meeting put in my schedule. Uh, question I have for you is, um, I was just thinking about the case that I'm going to present, and I'm. I'm thinking, boy, maybe this is something she needs. Um, in terms of insurance um, access, does insurance generally pay for the art therapy for adults? Yeah, I mean, because it's not, there's not a, a specific art therapy code. Um, oh, okay. Here, here. And so, yeah, so uh, yeah, either, you would just build like a normal therapy session, your 90834 or whatever. So um, yeah, because most I would say are either, yeah, professional counselors or professional social workers and have had a licensure. So, so you would just build it that way. Okay. Well, that's really helpful because I've, I have so many patients that I think if I can get them engaged to do this, I think it would be helpful, really helpful for them. So yeah. And what kind of, uh, do you have a wait list or is there easy, you know, how long is, you know, how long does it take for someone to get in generally? Uh, I think it depends. For me, I, I'm actually um, mostly just doing assessment evaluation right now. I'm not uh, practicing a lot of art therapy with individual clients. And so, um, <clears throat> so again, there's, there's a handful, if you go to the um, board of, board of art therapists or registration board of art therapists, there's, there's a list there of, of registered art therapists uh, in Idaho. And like I said, there's about seven in, in Boise. And I know there's a, a, a few more up north too. So I think there's 14 in the States. So there's not a whole lot of us, um, but uh, there's, there's a few people around. I'm not sure what the uh, wait list is. Okay, thank you. At least I've got a resource now that I can go to. Yeah. So thank you for that. Well, wonderful. If there are additional questions, um, please put those in the chat. 